Welcome to the Healing Grove Podcast. I'm Dr. Kristen Ryman, an integrative holistic family physician, author of Life After Lyme, and host in this virtual space of learning, healing, and growing. I believe humans are like trees, and our physical limb is only one of many. Health on all limbs of the tree, emotional, conceptual, social, spiritual, is absolutely required for the whole tree that is you to be vibrantly well. I created the Healing Growth Podcast as a place to showcase some of the world's best integrative and holistic medicine, to expose you to transformative tools and mindset shifts for all limbs of your tree. I hope you enjoy our conversation in the Healing Grove today as much as I enjoyed having it. So, hey, everyone, welcome to the Healing Grove podcast. I am so over the moon excited to introduce you to my new friend, Dr. Jill Krista, today. Dr. Jill is a pioneering naturopathic doctor. She's a best selling author, she's a devoted educator, and she's a creative innovator. Her superpower and I can attest to this because I've been on the other side of her teaching, is to make complex medical concepts simple and digestible for the average human. Um, and I can't wait for you to hear what she has to say about the brain and, as it relates to toxins and infections, because I think it's going to be a really digestible bit for you. Um, her passion is to elevate the well-being of the planet by elevating the well-being of its inhabitants. And whenever I read that or see that, it makes me want to cry because that's one of my passions too. And I'm, I feel like we're cut from the same cloth in many ways. Yes. Yeah. Her books, memberships, online courses are all available. We'll talk about those at the end. They're all out there to support people looking for concrete steps to conquer their own health challenges. And they're, they focus on conditions that cause injury to the brain and nervous system, including mold, vector-borne infections like Lyme and co-infections, and the debilitating autoimmune processes that can develop from these exposures called PANS and PANDAS. We're going to talk a lot about that in today's conversation. Um, she's recently turned her efforts to supporting children and teens struggling with pandas and pans. And as a mother of kids, two kids affected by pans, she's combined all the knowledge she gained through that experience and her clinical and personal experience into an indispensable book, which I have right here, a light in the dark for pandas and pans. I highly recommend this to anyone who after this talk is feeling like, wow, really called to learn more about this condition, which is so, so prevalent in our world. So thank you, Dr. Jill, for sharing your time and wisdom with us. Thank you for the honor of being here on your podcast. Yeah, for sure. So I always start by asking people to give us a little um, glimpse into what put you on this path, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. I ended up um, practicing in Southern Wisconsin, which ended up being Lyme country. And I didn't know that. <laughs> and when you look at the incidence maps now, it's always like number three or four in the country. And people don't really think about the Midwest as a hotbed for Lyme, but it is, it turns out. Um, so I was working with Lyme patients and realizing why well, I really don't understand this condition. You know, I thought of it as a joint problem and realizing, oh no, it's really more of a neurotoxin problem. And then there's all that other inflammatory stuff. So I went to, through ILADS, the the physician training that we both did. So I got my Lyme literacy beefed up and combining that with my naturopathic training, it, it followed all the rules of you find and treat the cause and people tend to get better. And except I had this group of people that weren't getting better. And, um, in that mix of people, one of them, we found toxic black mold in his home. And that was kind of the beginning of my mold journey was, Oh, I wonder if mold is what's going on with this other person that can't get over their Lyme disease and this other person that can't. And it turns out, yes, there was mold exposure, either current or past in almost all of those cases. So that's when I went down the mold Pandora's box and, um, got my, uh, I don't know, cut my teeth, so to speak, and mold a little bit more by digging into the animal research. Um, there isn't a lot of human research in mold illness that is beyond the respiratory, um, mm -hmm. Mold, the mold spores are really what get into the respiratory symptoms, but there's all these on other non-respiratory things that can happen with mold illness, which I know, you know, um, that are more based on the chemicals and the mycotoxins and things like that. So that's where I then developed a protocol, <clears throat> excuse me, on how we deal with this mold thing. So again, find and treat the cause people tended to get better. And then we had mold happen in my own house. So even though I was 
you know, a decade into working with it. That just shows you how tricky mold can be because I didn't see it. Um, it was a relatively new house. It was new to us, but you know, not an old house. I had all these preconceived ideas, even though I was working with patients. Um, and it turned out we had mold in our house. So when the flood revealed itself to us and I said, Oh, this is mold. It's not me going into perimenopause. It's not, you know, my kids having a, a flare of their pans, which I'm also a mom of kids with twins with pans. Um, oh, this is, this is mold. And that's when I decided to write the book. You know, I'm not, I never thought of myself as an author, but I just had this, I was just compelled to get that information out there. And as I thought I was kind of just writing it to my patient base, you know, like just a few people. And as the book got out there, it was just like, oh my goodness, mold is, is truly a pandemic. You know, it is a problem across all kinds of places, military housing, hospitals, schools, not just homes. Um, and then the sequela of meaning what can happen, the result of having this, when kids are exposed to this, or when pregnant mamas are exposed to mold is they can develop pandas and pans. And so, yeah, it just kind of has rolled into, I have a lot of in the trenches experience with pandas and pans because not only my kids, but then when you get known in the community as somebody who's helping special kids, then, you know, a lot of special kids, I get to see them. Find you. They find yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah. And so I just kind of took that same concept that I did with my mold book and, and put it into the pandas book so that people had really actionable stepwise methodology to, to get started on their healing path. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, kind of my <laughs> course yeah. in a short. <laughs> you came, came by all this learning, honestly, in the hard way for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of people have never maybe even heard this term in my community. So I wonder if you wouldn't define, if you could define pandas and pans and kind of give us a little bit of the history of how this, this term came to be discovered or talked about. Sure. The, I don't know that I'm really an expert in the history, but pandas and pans, um, they, they're both underneath an umbrella of autoimmune encephalopathies. So I'll break that down. Autoimmune means attacking yourself. So the body starts to attack its own self and encephalopathy meaning brain. So the kids develop an autoimmune disease that attacks their own brain and particularly certain areas of the brain that cause certain symptoms that you could kind of tie to those areas of the brain. So you'll see an increase in anxiety and fears, a lot of separation anxiety from a parent or a bedroom or a bed. Um, just, you know, the world becomes not a very safe place because the area of the brain that gets attacked is the limbic system, which is our, our, um, safety monitoring area of the brain. So, uh, the reason why we call it, and then you can see other, we can talk about other symptoms like OCD and tics and eating disorders and, um, behavioral regression, like a teenager starts talking baby talk or, um, a child who was potty trained, loses their potty training, um, handwriting deteriorates, those kinds of things. Um, and then you can see outbursts of, of behavior too, like aggression and anger and irritability. Also, we also see abdominal pain, kind of low grade abdominal pain in urinary frequency. So these are very somatic, meaning of the body symptoms. They're very real symptoms that are induced by filling the toxin cup too full and then sprinkling on an infection on top and boom, it sets off these conditions. They're named differently because the infection that sets it off in pandas has to be strep. We need to be able to track back some sort of strep pharyngitis, meaning strep throat or strep perianitis, which is the often missed one, um, which is strep that you can get around, around the bottom, around the anus on a child. Um, we can also see uh, gut strep. So people that when we do a, a stool test, we'll see a high strep count there as well. So pan does has a specific clinical criteria to diagnose it, where we have to be able to track back a strep. There are some strep markers that may be positive in the, in the blood that we can track pans then, um, was the one it, it kind of opens it up where it could be infection or even not even infection. It could be toxin exposure. So in one guy's case in my community, um, he, his toxic load was getting filled up because of a moldy house. He went to soccer practice right after they had sprayed the field. 
and he ended up with pants. And so, you know, it can be that toxin load. We were never really able to track back an infection that set that off. Now, granted, there might have been a common cold or something because we're exposed to stuff all the time. And, you know, soccer players, they're out there in rainy, cold spring weather. And so it sure could have been some kind of cold or flu or something like that. But there was never any moment where they were like, oh, yeah, he was sick. And then, boom, you know, this happened. Instead, we were able to track it to the the spring because other kids on the on the team also had some aggravations, which was interesting. It's a nice thing about being a small community. You can kind of start to make connections. Yeah. Yeah. See the patterns emerging in your Mm -hmm. neighbors. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm curious to know, did did the rest of the kids who weren't your patients, did the families understand that this is what they were seeing was a pans or pandas flare, or was it just sort of chalked up to like, Oh, he's having a bad day or I gave him too much sugar or, you know, allergies. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a lot of educating to do. (laughs) Yeah. Is this, so this is the part that sometimes makes my head go crazy is that it just feels like there's so much resistance to, to people seeing what's in front of them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that captures it. It's like a, there's a normalization of, you know, behavioral problems or tantrum. I saw a child this morning. I told you I'm in Amish country this week and I saw an Amish girl I've been following for seven years. And in the last, the last six months or so, she's had these like regressive episodes where she's like not speaking anymore. And she's not sleeping well and she's very irritable and she was in my office this morning and all she did for an hour and a half was hum through her nose and i learned from your book yeah that humming is a is actually a self medicating way of dealing with you know the nasal you know microbiome i mean you can explain it better than i can but i said to the mom i was like i'm sorry i'm just bringing this up because i'm now realizing she's done this the whole time i've known you but I just learned this. Yeah. This is something we should take a look at. And again, she was like, Oh, I just thought she's having a bad day. I'm like, but why did she wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be trouble? Like, no, yeah. I don't think people intentionally misbehave or have tantrums. This is like a brain issue. Right. It's so hard to watch that kind of going under the radar. And a lot of it does. You know, the kids are amazing at hiding their, their, pathologies or their struggle or their, you know, cause it's all in this internal experience and they know it's kind of weird, you know, and it's also really scary for them. So if they give in to those intrusive thoughts, which can be part of both conditions that can actually kind of make whatever they're afraid of real. And so they'll work through their, these, um, obsessive thoughts that are happening because the brain's on fire. It's not something they're purposefully thinking, Um, These are things that because the chemistry of the brain gets thrown off, there can be um, thoughts that aren't even, you would never think a kid could have, like you need to get up and go kill your dog. Like it can be really upsetting to them. And so they do a lot of self-soothing through these compulsions, which are the behaviors part and just try to distract themselves continuously. But some of the compulsions are medical treatment, you know? So when we hum what happens is that that rattling of the action of the hum builds up something called nitric oxide on the top of our, on our um, mucosal surfaces. And that creates a zone of sterility. And so if they're, that's a sign that you have a kid who has colonization in their sinuses and they need sinus treatment because they're humming because they're not winning the battle against the, the germs, basically. Such a, my, my head exploded when I read that. I was like, oh. <laughs> my gosh, how many Hummers have I been missing? (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And sometimes they, they know that the humming is weird too. So they'll hum like they'll, they might change the way they say things to be able to get a hum in there somehow. Um, or they'll do it when they think no one's listening. So some of these things that you don't catch in an appointment because they, the child knows that it's weird. And so they just won't do it, but it'll build up this compulsion will build up and then they'll have to have a discharge then somehow later because yeah. they're not winning the war. I mean, that's the, that's what's happening in the sinus cavity is that, you know, the microbes are winning. Yeah. So I want to talk about your approach to pandas and pans in a second, but one other thing I just want to highlight that was such an eye opener from your book was this idea that a lot of kids sort of came in to the world preloaded with infections, preloaded with toxins or dispositions, and were from a very early age before sort of the age of self-awareness, 
had developed these behaviors and this experience of being in their body and in their brain, and they don't even know it's not normal. Mm-hmm. And that to me is one of the hardest things about treating kids is, you know, asking them, do you, have, you know, did your, do you feel like your brain's not working for you today? You know, or some variation of that is not always going to get you where you need to go because they're like, this is just a normal Thursday, right? Like the only brain they've ever known. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think congenital infections are missed a lot. And that's the case, um, for myself, I gave my kids Lyme disease and, you know, I was diagnosed with, you know, in air quotes, fibromyalgia, you know, oh, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Everybody has aches and pains, blah, blah, blah. And, and that was misdiagnosed chronic Lyme. And I did really well with it. Cause I have a healthy lifestyle. I think I was, I came in with a, with some vitality that I have was able to draw from. And I'm very grateful for that. However, because it went undiagnosed, it took the stress of pregnancy to sort of allow it to reactivate. And I gave it to my kids. So had I been well treated, we wouldn't be where we are today. Um, so I think, you know, catching those below the radar sort of situations is really important. So these kids, then I, I talk about in my book where I'm kind of, I call my kids that they have pans, but that's not really an appropriate use of the term. We kind of need a third category. I'm going to call it plans or something like that, like pediatric Lyme associated neuropsych syndrome, you know, so there's some kind of co-infection, but it's not always Lyme. It can be Bartonella, but BC has some of the co-infections, um, which I gave my kids all the nice trifecta of Borrelia babesia and Bartonella. Yep. <laughs> I also gave him a great sense of humor. So, you know, Hey, you get <laughs> good in the, the bad. Whole package. You gave the whole package. <laughs> yeah. So that they are that case of congenital. So we never had the acute boom. This was the time it was a slow, um, there was always some, a li- uh, little bit of change with the immune system and neurology. And it wasn't until I was at a Lyme conference for my Lyme patients that I heard Dr. Charles Ray Jones presenting on pediatric congenital Lyme. And I was just like, Oh, Oh. And at that time, my kids were 11, you know? So like it, that went on a long time before we knew, cause before that they were diagnosed with tick disorder, ADHD, you know, all the, all the other things all the that we like to, yep. Yep. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. So, and it turns out it was well-managed pants cases that because I have my training and I'm a, I'm a czar about diet and exercise and sleep and they were doing okay. But then you add in a little bit of puberty and a little bit of mold and, and you're off to the races with some florid cases. So yeah, it's, um, there is this thing where the immune system never knew itself without the influence of these infections. And it almost becomes a genetic intertwining that can happen with them, which is really fascinating. And that's where IVIG is really helpful. Yeah. Say more about the genetic intertwining. Yeah. I just, I don't, I don't know that I have any, there's no data on that. It's just my experience that the ones that come in with congenital infections, because they never developed without that influence seem to be a little more difficult at pushing it completely out of the body. You know, they're going to be the ones that can ride in that chronic area a, a lot longer and it can take bigger pushes for, for it to get out of the influence to get out of their body. Like in many of these chronic, especially Borrelia cases, they're the ones that are going to need repeat IVIG, you know, for years, maybe much higher antibiotics than I as a naturopath would have formerly been comfortable with. And we can judge that you know, just like, oh, their microbiome, their, yeah, you know, those are important things, except the force of the Borrelia is here. Sometimes you need to meet it with the same amount of force. So in my Mm -hmm. experience, the congenital kids need both a gentle and a firm push at the same time. So you, you know, it's that like, we're going to, we're going to press as hard as we can to push this out of the body and nourish, 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 nourish behind. Yeah. Not only antibiotics, not only IVIG is going to work. Cause you also have to do the nourishing part. Yeah. Wow. Well, I wonder if we could get into talking a little bit about your four kind of core pillars. You don't call sure. them pillars. Um, the core core. core. Yeah. The core, <laughs> core. The core, core. Yeah. I want to talk about those because it really helps simplify in many ways, a very, very complex roadmap that involves a lot of moving parts 
Um, and I think it's a helpful place to start just so people understand kind of what, what they're up against and, and what it looks like to come out of that. Thank you. I, I'm, that means a lot that you say it simplifies it because I really put a lot of effort into that. Um, the idea is that, I mean, I, I joke in the book, I could have done core 10 because most of these kids need more than just the core four. They need other things. You need, you know, a team of people and that kind of thing. But I disciplined myself to get to four because when I sat down and I was like, okay, what it, what are the things that really moves the needle when you're in a crisis? These are the things. And then all the other stuff is like the, how you get out of it in a permanent way. But these core things are basically categories to really move the needle and to really focus on, even if you didn't do all the other stuff, your kid is still going to get improvement with these core. So the first one is tame the flame. The second is beat the bugs. It's kind of like a stepwise, um, Mm -hmm. kind of way I do things. Uh, the third one is to regulate immunity, which is really about bolstering the immunity. And then the fourth is guarding the gates. So if toxins and infections set this off and continue to tweak the system, we need to stop letting those things into the body. So, um, so tame the flame is in essence, reducing cytokines, reducing inflammation and reducing mast cell involvement. And what the reason I I'm calling them just the core, because you, there isn't one way to do this. Every kid is going to have a different thing, a different soup of chemicals or toxins or infections that got them there. So we want to be able to give flexibility on picking the things that are really going to affect the change for that kit. Cause some, for some kids, it's going to be their fatigue is the main thing. And some it's going to be the fears are the main thing, the fear of infection for some it's eating is the big struggle for some it's, you know, separation anxiety for some it's abdominal pain, um, or urinary frequency. They can't go to school because they have to go to the bathroom so often. So we pick the, the things in that category, each of the cores has a plethora of tools that you can use. And we want to be targeting the tool that is effective for the child, for what they have going on. And I'll have families where there's one pandas case and two, two pans. So we have three kids in the family, one has pandas and two have pans and there are different tools for each kid. There's going to be the yeasty kid and there's going to be the strep kid. And they're, you know, the one who can't have any food coloring or that sets it off. So, um, in the tame, the flame or uh, to back this up, I also give you the, how to put it all together (laughs) so that, you know, this is kind of like how I'm approaching it. Usually I'm really loading them up on what I'm calling flame tamers and mast cell managers in the beginning to just get that calm the system down. Because sometimes then, and often when we go in to beat the bugs, bugs will fight back or they'll die off and that can cause a lot more inflammation. So we want to really calm down and reduce the inflammation before we go poking the bear, so to speak. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And I will say that, um, uh, your goal of getting just the four things that will really push the needle and, and get kids a little better or even a lot better. I can completely verify that that is happening in my patient population. Awesome. I've been using this book like a Bible for the last six months. And it's been the first thing for many families who have kids with pans and pandas, which as you know, can be just such a devastating state of affairs. I mean, talk about a kid not knowing what a normal brain looks like. Some of these families forget what it is to go out in public, like to a life that's outside of their, the chaos of their house where everyone's afraid of being injured. Um, So these families for the first time are saying to me, oh my gosh, there's something here that's helping finally. So thank you for- Thank you. Thank you for, for downloading this from wherever you got it, your vast <laughs> knowledge and your inspiration to the, to us and the planet, because it's, it really does feel like a, a missing piece that is so welcome now. Yeah. This, this, these can, thank you so much. And I, the first week the book was out and I got these emails of like, in a week, we have seen our kid turn around after six years of struggle, not only turn around, but start reading chapter books you know, okay with going to bed in their own bedroom, you know, it, all of these things in just like these short amount of times. And of course I'm just bawling, you know, I'm just like, Oh, that's so awesome. You know, <laughs> but you know, the, I think that there's a lot more of this going on than, than we know, because 
you can, as a parent, you can feel so judged. You can feel like, you know, why don't we have our shit together? You know, what's our deal? Why can't we get this figured out? And you can't because there's a paradigm of belief that if this is happening in their head, there's something wrong with the child. And it's like a mental health issue. And so many mental health issues are body issues. They need treatment. They don't need judgment. They don't need brain chemistry tweaking, although that can be helpful for some kids, but why is the brain chemistry off? They need treatment. You know, they need to be detoxified. They need to have the infections addressed, modulate and boost that immune system and stop the, with the exposures, you know? Yeah. 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 So it's creating a big paradigm shift. It is. I'm thinking about the people who might be listening or, you know, learning about pandas and kind of instantly are like, oh, well, my kids just with well within normal limits in terms of their bad behavior or their tantrums or their, you know, school fears or their anxiety, or I had anxiety. My kid has anxiety, right. Or, you know, we all have, you know, whatever name this pots. We all have pots disease, right. We all have pots and therefore we all have low blood pressure, but like it's to me, it's, it's hard to address that because number one, if you're telling them that it's a brain issue, that's creating that in people. The other thing that people I think get stuck in is like, well, the brain can't I mean, the brain is set, right? The brain you can't do anything about the brain, mm-hmm. right? You get, you get a brain injury, for example, and you're told, oh, your brain will recover for 60 days. Not even mentioning that that's the amount of time that insurance happens to pay for your rehab. Like it's <laughs> not like the brain stops recovering after 60 days. Like you just need to keep doing stuff. And so this is one of the things I, I struggle with is that people don't want to talk about their brain injury or their mental health issue or their kid's mental health issue or their kid's brain injury, because there's such a stigma around, well, oh, well, good luck with that. All bets are off. Not nothing to do there. Right. Other than suffer. Well, that's the, that's the reason pan does took so long. That was the first derivation of this was Dr. Sue Suido identified this Unfortunately, it was in the National Institutes of Mental Health, meaning we're not, that's not real. That's something that's not, you know, oh, that mental health stuff, just let them deal with it, the the crazies, you know? So that's the unfortunate thing is the, the brilliant mind that found this happened to be within this, this paradigm again, that mental health is all in your head. And it's like, no, it's actually all in your gut usually. (laughs) So, you know, this is a body problem causing behavior and brain changes. And that's, I think what, you know, the paradigm shift that this is creating and actually COVID was kind of a gift with that because I think it opened a lot of people's eyes to, first of all, that, oh, maybe chronic Lyme is still Lyme infection. Huh. You know, that people can be debilitated after having Lyme disease and it's not, you know, it's not all in their head. And cause now people with COVID are having long haul. Okay. Right. You know, and the other thing is that people after COVID are having neuropsychiatric symptoms. Mm-hmm. And that's the, for, I think a lot of doctors I've seen the conventional system go, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, but then there is an obsession of, well, how is it getting into the brain? Well, how is it getting into the brain? Well, what we find with strep is it's not the strep bacteria getting into the brain, it's the cytokines, it's the inflammation from having strep on your nasal passages or in your throat that are riding the olfactory bulb and getting into the brain. So it's not the bug necessarily getting into the brain. Although with COVID, we do see that there can be spike protein that can get into the brain through the vagus nerve, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the brain to be making the difference in the brain. It just needs to get, if it's tweaking the microbiome, like I write in the book, this brain problem is a tummy problem. It's, you know, trouble in the tummy causes trouble in the brain. So that's a big focus of the regulate immunity. The core three is to get the gut microbiome really addressed. That's why I put things like butyrate, probiotics, postbiotics, which are I'm kind of obsessed with right now. That's basically fecal micro microbiota transplant, but taking it orally. So putting in, and we see this with studies, like we can see a study of mice when you take lean mice and obese mice. So they, they feed them different feed to create different, you know, body compositions. Then they take the microbiota. So they basically, you know, sterilized poop from the lean mice and they give it to the obese mice and the obese mice become lean again. So we take healthy person poop, sterilize it 
give it to kids who have a brain problem that is from a gut problem and boom, we can address the brain problem. It's yeah. just the coolest thing. I remember reading some of those studies, although tell me about the sterilization part. Cause it seems like if you'd sterilize it, it wouldn't be able to transfer whatever vital magic is in those living beings, but it sounds like maybe you still yeah. can. Yeah. Cause it's not the, it's the being a postbiotic. Um, it's, you're also getting nucleotides, growth factors, um, bile salts, bile acids, and the microbes themselves. So you're just getting the whole milieu. And that's, that's a lot similar to how we do with plant medicine is we're not trying to go for that one standardized extract because the plant knows we're going to give you an antimicrobial. You're going to need something to clear that out. You're going to need something to soothe that passage. You're going to need something to turn the cell over. You just need something that's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, because there will be inflammation. So the whole plant comes with all of this wisdom and knowledge of the other things that are needed with that one targeted action of killing a bug. Um, I see this postbiotic as the same thing. So it's thanabiotic, T-H-A-E-N-A, -A, if anybody is listening. Um, I'm seeing, I'm just super excited about this. And had I known about it when I wrote my book, like this is definitely going into the second edition and going into my training course for doctors, because it's really created a, I didn't even know it existed. So, um, it's created a big, cause I, I write about in the book, I would do fecal my, microbiota transplant if it were an approved indication for pandas and pans. Cause I am seeing some, there are some autism studies, clinical studies that are showing that that is making a difference for autism. Um, so to be able to take it as a capsule is super cool. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about autism for a minute in the context of pans and pandas. My assumption, and I only have my assumption and my, my patients, I have a lot of autistic kids who come to see me. I don't look at the whole range of humanity anymore. I look at a very select group mm -hmm. of people. So I don't know how to really gauge this without that bias, but my assumption would be that autistic kids have a much higher incidence of pans and pandas just because so many of the same underlying kind of usual suspects are present, the toxicity, the, you know, immune, immune imbalances, the gut issues, dysbiosis, and of course the infections, a lot of those, th that little soup is usually present in the autistic kids too. So mm -hmm. what, what is your impression of that? Like, what's the incidence? Is it higher in autistic kids? Is it lower because their immune system isn't able to mount an autoimmune response? What do you, what are you seeing? That's a really good question. Um, I think if I were, I would have assumed there'd have been more crossover than I'm experiencing. But again, like you say, you have your bias of your, your selection bias, of the people that come to see you. Um, I think that there are different mechanisms going on. I think that with a, with a pandas pans, it's the limbic system. Whereas with autism, we're seeing changes like with the aluminum injury with vaccines and those sorts of things with, um, the, there is a male prevalence of autism from exposure to ochratoxin, the mycotoxin ochratoxin, which is a mold exposure. So, you know, whether someone's going to go down that bifurcated path or the middle path to have both conditions, um, mm -hmm. I think that there is a lot less crossover than I would have, I would have assumed, um, because I think that the injury that's happening is in different areas of the brain from each, um, each mechanism. Yeah. But I, I, I think that'll be really interesting to see as we move forward, because autism also, I, he I heard your interview with Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who's brilliant. <laughs> and I talk about her in my book there. There's also a correlation there with glyphosate as much as there is also with, you know, the, the vaccine kinds of heavy metals and that exposure. So we've got, you know, kind of the same, same things that can be causing the system to break down, but in pandas and pans, and it flips the switch into autoimmune. And I don't think with autism, we've really identified that it goes into an autoimmune situation with autoantibodies, um, but we shall see. I think there's more study to be done. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things you'd mentioned um, that you use as a tool for teaching kids in particular is a little cartoon. I Yay. wonder if you see your little, I haven't seen it yet. I'm really excited to see it. You mentioned oh, something. I must, have, I must have missed that chapter or that page because I don't remember it, but I, I'm eager to, to see this because I'm always looking for ways to kind of help people visualize what's happening and mm -hmm. kind of take, take in the information in a way that makes sense. Can you share that with us now? Sure. Yeah. And interrupt me if I don't share it appropriately to, to where you hear the sound. I am mm -hmm. clicking share sound. 
Okay. And optimize for a video clip. So hopefully we will see it. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yep. All right. So here we go. The Brain's Chief and Warrior. A limbic story by Dr. Jill Krista. Your brain has two important parts. One part is for thinking, and the other part is for survival. The thinking part makes decisions. This is the part you use when you make up your mind. The survival part watches for danger. This is the part you use when you feel scared. Both are equal and important. The thinking part is in charge of reading, learning, and planning. We can think of this part as the chief. The survival part is in charge of sensing smells, feeling hunger, sensing danger, knowing when you need to stay awake and when it's safe to feel sleepy. We can think of this part as the warrior. Normally, if the warrior part of the brain sensed a danger, such as a wildfire, it would identify it by the smell, the sight, or by hearing the crackling. It sends a message to the chief. Fire! The chief uses its senses as well. It listens for the crackling, the smell of smoke, and sees the fire and says, yep, we better get the body out of here. Then the warrior part of the brain takes care of any brain inflammation that exposure might have caused. Sometimes things don't go as planned, like in the case of tiny exposures that don't have a smell, such as mold, bacteria such as strep, or toxins. It can be hard to sense the invaders. The warrior part of the brain can sense it because it's the first to be affected. So it sends a message to the chief, but we got a problem because these bypass the senses. They're not heard, smelled, or seen. The chief says, no go. I don't see it, smell it, or hear it. The body's just gonna stay. So the warrior part of the brain is left to take care of the brain inflammation using every weapon possible, including mast cells, which can lead to more brain inflammation. The warrior part of the brain tries the original route to send messages, a backup route, and then tries to be really loud to get the chief's attention. But because the chief couldn't smell it, see it, hear it, or taste it, it's as if the chief didn't even get the message. This is frustrating to the warrior side of the brain. When the chief stops responding to the warrior's signals, the warrior starts to feel frustrated, but also unsafe. It starts to worry about the other things it's in charge of. Since the chief isn't moving the body to safety, the warrior becomes extra worried about anything it breathes, drinks, or eats. It doesn't even feel safe to sleep. The most important thing is to get rid of the infections, the mold exposure, and the chemicals bothering the warrior. But even when we do that, sometimes the warrior continues to send warning messages to the chief. The warrior part of the brain just wants someone to listen. Getting the two sides of the brain communicating again mends the split between the chief and the warrior and they realize they're on the same team. And you can feel better. There's my goofy story. <laughs> I love it. It's super sweet. So I'm, I, I'm really glad you shared that. And I can't believe I missed that from the book, but here's what I want to hear. What do you do with a kid? Like what tools or helpful practices can a kid do and learn that helps them get their brain to kind of talk to each other again and trust itself again? All right. So a lot of that is going to be under the limbic retraining 
um, umbrella. So there can be different programs that we can use like DNRS, like the Gupta program, but for kids, we move to things that are more devicey, <laughs> usually um, some neurofeedback. I like to use frequency specific microcurrent, homeopathy, different things like that. So there are so many tools to get that split mended so that the brain starts to work as a team again. Yeah. There's a ton that we can do. And so I just try to kind of, I have a little handout, you know, like here are the things, and it's always growing because there's always new programs that are coming out, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. Primal trust is also one that's kind of been for like teenagers. Um, so there are different, different ways. You just kind of have to match it to what a kid is willing to do. Yeah. Homeopathy has been phenomenal. Yeah. One of the things I love about this little Bible of mine in front of me that I've been keep talking about <laughs> is that you have a whole section on homeopathic remedies and you give a really nice description, multiple descriptions of like the child who needs this remedy. Mm -hmm. um, what I tell my parents to do with this book is like, first of all, it's like drinking from a fire hose. The first third of it is really helpful information that's basically paints a picture for you about why your kids are acting the way they are, what's going on in their brain and what we're going to do to sort of stop that and quell it and get them back on track. And then you have the fire hose of options, which are yes. <laughs> arranged. I'm just going to say it neatly arranged into those four core categories. Um, but you always give really beautiful descriptions of like, the child that needs this, right? So yes. I tell them at that point, stop trying to memorize everything, stop trying to understand everything and just kind of like gently float through the words. And when you feel your kid jump out of the page at you, take your little sticky note and be like this, stick it on yes. the page and be like, this is the thing, put an arrow so you don't have to go back and reread it. Like when you feel yeah. your kid leaping out at you, then we're gonna come back and make a big plan that includes something from each of those categories that fits your kid. Mm -hmm. So it's just such a helpful way, I think for for parents who are tired, who aren't sleeping, who are overwhelmed, who may be confused, who are dealing with all the judgment that you talked about. Mm -hmm. It's just been such a, a godsend. So yeah. And even starting with one, I have a, a category called the botanical avatars. And the reason I call them the avatar avatar means ideal. So an ideal botanical medicine would hit all of the different me varying mechanisms that we see with this problem. So I talked about the microbiome changes, the brain chemistry changes, the, um, the microglia are the, the resident brain immune cells. I have this whole joke about them being kind of naughty monkeys. in the mind. So, uh, they're very, very naughty little monkeys. Um, so, and also do adjusting what naughty monkeys would do, you yeah. know, they're, we can't expect much else from them. If they're monkeys, they're going to, right. they're, they're going to fling poo. poo. Yeah. <laughs> I know I debated. I was like, Oh, do I, I, this is how I explain it to kids. So I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to put wow. it in the book that monkeys, that's brilliant. It's microbiome a monkey's fling poo. So we got to get all the poo out of your brain. Um, so yeah, a botanical avatar is something that's handling all of that plus addressing the gut pain, plus addressing the, the increased generalized pain, plus addressing the fears, you know, is there, wouldn't it be amazing if there was a plant that could do all those and there are, and there are a bunch of them. So that category, if someone's just going to focus on, I can only handle one thing. I'd say, try to do two things, flame tamers and a botanical avatar. And that fits your kid. And I tell a story, you know, if they're, um, the swampy boggy kid, that's Bacopa, you know, so there, there are stories about the plants that help you find it. And just even those two things, I mean, the, the family I told you that called me or that wrote me, um, this massive change in one week, they just did fever few at the flare dose. And that was the only thing they did. And their kid came around to reading chapter wow. books after our six years of total impairment. So these wow. plants are powerful, powerful allies for us. Yeah. yeah. And it's not all plants. I mean, I also talk about the medications that could be useful and, um, probably the best resource in the whole book is the medication compatibility chart. So if somebody's brand new to this, you know, holistic medicine that can feel really scary to know what's safe to do with a kid and what's safe to do with what medication. So there's a chart and you can get it, um, on my website. It's just med dash compatibility. So it's drkrista.com slash med dash compatibility. And it's a living chart. I'm always adjusting, <laughs> you know, as I learn more things, but I had it vetted by you know, pharmacists and everybody to make sure it was safe. And you can see on there what's safe to do together so that you can raise your confidence in using these tools. 
Well, that, I mean, that's, I think one of the, the best parts of this, the whole system you've put out there for the world is that it's a DIY recovery map. You know, it's something that people can take and run with and get huge benefit from without seeing a doctor. Yeah. Right. Is, which is huge. I think because not everybody has, there aren't enough doctors, just like with mold, there aren't enough doctors who understand this and yeah. you can do some real harm with your kid, um, being, you know, the term gaslit, which I still don't really understand why that's the word that we use, but, you know, <laughs> kind of disregarded and that can create trauma and we don't need to add trauma to an already internally traumatized child or, yeah. or parents in that case. Yeah. 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 The system has suffered enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without, without doctors and other practitioners doing more harm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And they can, they're not meaning to, it's just the, the paradigm that we're all working in that we've been trained in medical school is that mental health is a problem with the, the brain. It's a problem with the person. It's almost, it has this sort of blame thing to it. And, and that's, these are physical body problems and yeah. they're expressing as behavioral issues. Yeah. Well, what is it? I think Dr. Daniel Amen says, you know, it's mental illness is a brain illness that steals your mind. Ah, uh, that's a beautiful way to put it. Mm -hmm. It's just so right on. And it, I think it, if, if we can embrace that, it really destigmatizes and it allows the possibility for healing. Right. That's just it. Is if we, if we label something mental illness, there's no further investigation. It's management. And, and I think that that's, that's what I'm hoping that this, and, you know, with COVID happening, that there'll be that paradigm change that we need, that people still yeah. need treatment, you know, and not that they weren't getting treatment, but it, you know, talk therapy isn't going to correct this, right. this problem. It's going to assist with the managing the intrusive thoughts and things, but it's not going to treat it. Right. Well, it becomes management as opposed to healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, that's COVID silver lining number 412. As far as <laughs> I'm, we're all learning this from that little Corona virus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it de definitely. I mean, being a, you, maybe you probably felt this way too, but having been in the Lyme world and the mold world and all this sort of stealth infection, immune modulating kind of infection world for so long before COVID hit, I was like, oh, I see what I've been warmed up for. Yes. <laughs> I see now what learning all that was really about learning. You got it. I, I felt like a lot of our colleagues were just sort of like, oh, it's game on. You know, we know how to do this. And we how to do this. Yeah. yeah. I'd already been using hydroxychloroquine with Babesia forever. Yeah. It was just sort of like, oh yeah, here we go. We're just, yeah, we know same how tool. to do it. New bug. new bug, same tools. New bug, similar, similar issues. Yeah. And just a similar process, right. Of like getting in the ring with something where we don't know the answer in advance, mm -hmm. be willing to kind of try on a tool, see how it goes, pay attention to harms, right. And avoid anything that's going to be harmful, but like really yeah. you know, it's a journey of discovery, right. With all of these things, even if it's a bug that's been around for centuries, it's still different in every person based on the terrain and what else is there. So you really have to be willing to kind of engage in that dance. Right. And be comfortable with uncertainty. Yes. Because the train keeps that needle keeps moving, you know, let's add, e let's add Wi-Fi. Let's add put a Wi-Fi emitting device in everyone's pocket. Let's add 5G, let's add chemicals, let's add, yeah. So yeah. we we do, it's the same person, maybe even the same bug in a completely different fishbowl. Yeah, doesn't get old. No. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps it fresh and spicy. <laughs> Uh, well, there's a couple more things I want to ask you, but they're, they, they feel like they might be a total, you know, off topic, but to me, they're, they kind of stem from the same naturopathic, you know, philosophy and the plants and the avatars. I heard you say on Scott Forsgren's blog cast, blog cast, is that what he called it? Blog cast that you were making your own black walnut tinctures. Yes. Trees in your, and that got me thinking to, about how many trees and plants I have in my yard that I've been learning about in the last several years, you know, including huge, you know, walls of Japanese knotweed and oh. artesia growing everywhere, like sweet Annie everywhere and plantain everywhere. And all of these like very powerful healers, like I've got healers and shamans, like springing up on my Creek bed, yes. including black walnut everywhere. It grows like crazy in Pennsylvania. It's like considered sort of a weed, but, um, I've always been 
like sort of flirting with harvesting and trying stuff. And I actually made some stevia tincture recently to sweeten my stuff when my stevia Ooh. ran out. So I'm kind of going in that direction. So I was just wondering if you wouldn't share like how to make black walnut tincture out of your tree. Cause I've got yes. some of them and I'd be curious. Yeah. And perfect timing because this is the season they're just dropping right now. So this right? is the perfect time. Um, I, I love sharing this. And this is one of the things that I've been talking with a, a good friend of mine. I'm like, should we just start doing like how to make your own herbal medicine courses? You know, yeah. it'd be so yes. much fun. I yeah. will come close. Okay. <laughs> Cause that's the other empowerment thing, right? That's the, the books are very actionable, but then you need to find those things somewhere right. that someone right. else is making. And some things do take, you know, a lot more, um, science, like the, the company that I usually use my, for tinctures is herbal vitality. Like right here, there's my, uh, I was pouring a tincture this morning and, um, yeah, so there is a lot of science and to how he's doing it, you know, when to harvest and that kind of thing. But black walnut is a very forgiving way, forgiving plant to make because it is, it already comes with this intense juglone. So this, this intense aspect of the, of the plant that gives you so much leeway and mistake making you can make, and you still make a great tincture. So you want to get that the hulls right or the the nuts when they drop down have this green hull around them and it's soft kind of fleshy not super soft but kind of it's more soft than the nut itself the the outer nut. So this hull of green comes I wonder if I have oh I wish I would have known you're going to ask I could bring um to show cuz I've just collected some today. Are your hands them, green? It turns my hands green. Uh so wear <laughs> gloves cuz your hands will turn dark, dark, dark brown. So they green at first and then they just turn dark brown and your tincture will as well. And that's totally normal. These are, as you extract the juglone, it'll turn into this deep, dark brown color. So the green outer hull, wear gloves. And what I do is in my cutting board, I just lay it all out with um, wax paper so that my cutting board doesn't get permanently stained with juglone. Cause it, it does, it's an intense mover of things. It's a great, um, well, I was going to say vermifuge, but what is it where it's like pushing things out and the word's gone. So I line it with wax paper. I bring them down and I cut around that green outer hull and you just, it's just like getting an avocado open. You know, you kind of got to loosen it. Um, so I'll cut that into fours and I put that into a glass jar and you want to make sure there's no, um, no aging that's happened with that. You want it green, green, green. So some of you might even need to pull off the plant if you want to make a big kettle of it. Um, and I just cut those into four while they're super green, put them into the jar and cover it with vodka and then seal it and make sure that the vodka is coming over the line of your, of the, um, hulls. And that just sits on a shelf for a month or two. I like to leave mine for two. And you just every so often, about every two or three days, shake that baby around and make sure that everything's moving and getting coated and that there's no, then it reduces fungal growth on as long as, you know, cause the lid can be kind of sitting there without any alcohol on it. So, you know, just shaking it up and down. And that's kind of like my morning, you know, workout is I take my tinctures and do the thing and it just sits there and then you strain it off and store it in amber glass and you have it for a mine go about, I give them three years expiration date. If it was made in a, you know, like, like herbal vitality, those will last 10 years, but you know, I'm not doing it in a sterile hooded area. I'm just doing it in my kitchen. So yeah. Yeah. And any vodka, any vodka, cheap vodka, expensive vodka, potato. I like vodka. to use organic just yeah. because I'm, yeah. So there's a prairie, something organic that I use for vodka and, you know, I buy it in the big, big old jugs and try and get them on like the black Friday holidays and the Christmas holidays. And I just stock up. Like if you came to my house, you'd be like, woo, she likes her drink, you know, because I have these like, stash of vodka in my like distillery. You got like a distillery going. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. That's for my tinctures. So I, some things do better in brandy, like, um, elderberries, which is also the season, you know, well, it's just kind of past the season, but, um, I'll grab all the elderberries and stick them in the freezer. Cause they're easier to get off the off mm. the vine then. And then those all go into brandy because that just does better with brandy. But when you have something that's really high, um, the, the things that you're trying to extract like juglone, 
you're wanting a little bit higher alcohol content. And there's the art. That's where, you know, some of the things when I, I'm just like, if it's too technical, I just rely on good old herbal vitality, but, um, which is a practitioner only line. So if you're listening, you're not a practitioner, that could be really frustrating. If you are not a practitioner, I also like Hawaii farm, P H A R M. They have a lot of nice glycerates for kids. Now you have on your website, um, some products, right? Can people get mm-hmm. things that you've already vetted and kind of, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm medical director for a company called a light health and with them, I'm working on making pandas glycerates for kids with all the mixes all together. So I've put in, you know, the particular flame tamers, botanical avatars, that kind of thing. There's not a lot of antimicrobials in there because those you can get from like Lime Core and you can get them from other places, but I'm handling the brain calming part of it, the pandas specific part of it. Um, nice. So, I didn't yeah. know. Is it available yet? Is that already out there? Um, there, I think they, they're sitting and waiting for testing results because they test them for impurities and yeast and molds and that kind of thing. So I think they're just sitting bottled, ready to go once they pass the testing. Yeah. So soon, um, so if be people wanted to find more about that down the road or more about you or your book, where's the best place for them to go? They can go to drkrista.com. That's D-R-C-R-I-S-T-A.com. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. Um, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you really would like people who are maybe new to this topic or starting to consider, wow, is my kid or me maybe dealing with an autoimmune brain issue? And should I buy the book? Should I look more into it? What would be a message for them that you'd like to share? First of all, trust yourself over anyone else. You are, you know, your kid better than anybody. (laughs) And also, um, if you do think, Ooh, this might be what's going on. And you go to Facebook groups and things, you're going to hear the worst case scenario. And so number one, don't be afraid of that, but also know that there are lots of smoldering situations where it's a lot easier to get on top of it and correct it at that stage than to put blinders on and be like, I don't even want this to be true. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to look. Um, and then your kid has the infection or the puberty or the whatever that, that trips it off. So I think, you know, trying to kind of rest out of the fear place. If you're listening to this and you're like, you know, or you're, you might even be telling, and I've heard this a lot from parents, they're telling themselves right now, oh, they, they just like to twirl. It's, that's, that's normal. You know, like you kind of talk yourself out of it, that it could be that it's a lot easier to look at it with a non-fear based place, knowing there's tools and get to it early than to ignore it and have a bigger problem later. Well said. This has been awesome. Thank you again so much for everything. It's been such a joy. Thank this you. community and also the world. It's just so, so awesome to learn from you and really. Thank you. Really I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Healing Grove podcast. If you liked it, please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to deepen your experience further, consider grabbing a copy of the Healing Grove playbook. With journal prompts for this podcast and 41 others, it's the perfect place to record your learnings, keep track of the tools you explore, and reflect on your own experience. Finally, it's important to mention that even though I am a doctor, nothing you hear on this podcast, whether from myself or my guests, constitutes medical advice. Any intervention you try should always be discussed with and supervised by a trusted member of your own healing team. Thanks for listening, and see you next time in the Healing Grove.